If we were to dare you to wave a magic wand, promising that with a single flourish you'd transform into the wealthiest royal in all of Europe, your mind might immediately transport you to the grand palaces of the United Kingdom, turning you into a member of the legendary Windsor family, or perhaps even to the opulent streets of Monaco as a member of the Grimaldi dynasty. However, once you've actually moved that enchanting item, you might find yourself in for quite the surprise. Instead of ruling over a vast kingdom teeming with millions of people, you'd find your royal domain to be a quaint little country, home to less than 40,000 souls, with a territory smaller than that of a typical city. Yes, our whimsical experiment in royal ascension would crown you as the prince or princess of none other than Liechtenstein. Yet, in this intriguing twist of fate, you'd be at the helm of a nation that, despite its modest size, harbors an unfathomably large fortune. And currently, leading this miniature but mighty realm is Prince Hans Adam II, a monarch whose $9 billion empire ranks him, in terms of privately held wealth, as wealthier than any Windsor or Monegasque leader you can think of. In today's episode, join us as we explore the fascinating world of a royal family whose wealth and influence defy the expectations set by their nation's geographical footprint, proving that in the realm of riches and royalty, size isn't everything. As we describe, the richest royal in Europe, the life and family history of Prince Hans Adam II. Prince Hans Adam II of Liechtenstein isn't just lounging around in his castle counting coins. As of 2024, he's sitting on a cool $9.12 billion, making him, by many accounts, the richest monarch in Europe in terms of private wealth. And his golden goose is LGT Group, a high-flying private banking and asset management firm with roots deep in the past 80 years. Indeed, under his watchful eye, LGT Group has blossomed, overseeing assets worth a hefty 287 billion Swiss francs, equal to around 300 billion US dollars by the end of 2022. And though it's based in Vaduz, Liechtenstein, this financial titan stretches its wealth-whispering talents across Europe, Hong Kong and Singapore, showcasing its globe-trotting prowess. But how's this for a plot twist? The prince's jackpot at LGT Group sits snugly under the umbrella of the Prince of Liechtenstein Foundation itself. This savvy setup not only manages the royal assets, but also counts among its treasures arable lands in Austria, priced like the finest plots in the region. And in terms of royal real estate, Hans Adam II could have several Netflix reality shows based around his mansion-filled empire. Of course, Vaduz Castle isn't just a pile of stones, it's a towering monument to the princely family saga, with a view to match. But the castle collection doesn't stop there. He's got Austrian strongholds aplenty, each a chapter of European history standing proud and lived in, blending past glory with present life. But wait, there's more to the prince than vaults and vistas. His art collection, a trove of over 1,600 pieces featuring the likes of Raphael, Rembrandt and Van Dyck, resides in the Liechtenstein Museum in Vienna. This billion-dollar love letter to the arts is a legacy measured in brushstrokes and brilliance. And beyond the balance sheets and the brushwork, Prince Hans Adam II doesn't shy away from the limelight in cultural and social circles. His involvement in the scout movement and his role as a doting grandfather peel back the layers of a man who wears many crowns, balancing the books and bedtime stories with equal flair. And though he's draped in titles that sound straight out of a fairy tale, Prince Hans Adam II embodies centuries of heritage and honor. In 2003, he flexed his princely powers in a constitutional referendum, securing the right to veto laws, dissolve parliament, and appoint judges, showcasing a blend of tradition and authority that keeps the principality ticking. And in a move echoing dynastic dances of old, Hans Adam II, in 2004, passed the governmental baton to his son, hereditary Prince Alois. This mirrors the mentorship of his own father, Prince Franz Joseph II, and ensures the continuity of a family that has mastered the art of ruling and the science of wealth. However, in a poignant chapter of his life, the prince's wife, Her Royal Highness Princess Marie, passed away in August 2021. Her story, 
From fleeing Prague to becoming a pillar of support and grace beside her husband adds a layer of depth to the princely narrative, with her legacy demonstrating a blend of strength, sophistication and service. Yet, in order to fully understand how Europe's richest royal came to embody a blend of class and prestige, and of course, how he even got the opportunity to make so much money in the first place, we first need to peel back the layers on this, one of the world's smallest and richest countries, by placing ourselves smack dab in the tumultuous middle of medieval Europe. In the early 12th century, the seeds of what would become a formidable dynasty, the House of Liechtenstein, were sown by one Hugo von Liechtenstein with the construction of Liechtenstein Castle. You see, Hugo, a figure who emerges in historical records around the year 1120, adopted his name from the fortress of Liechtenstein, positioned just south of Vienna, marking the beginning of the family's enduring legacy in the area. And during this period, the Liechtenstein family emerged not merely as proprietors of vast lands, but also as influential figures in Lower Austria, marking their ascent in the socio-political hierarchy of the region. By the year 1249, their strategic prowess was unmistakably demonstrated through the acquisition of Nikolsburg, now known as Mikulov, located in the southern Moravian region of the present-day Czech Republic. Now, this move wasn't just a territorial expansion. It was a chess move in the political landscape, elevating the Liechtenstein status and forming the nucleus of their estates until the mid-16th century. And their influence was such that they sometimes adopted the moniker von Liechtenstein von Nikolsburg, underscoring their ties to this key locale. As the 12th century unfolded, the Liechtenstein's ambitions widened through astute marriages and territorial acquisitions, including Petronell on the Danube and Rorau Castle. These were not mere vanity projects, but strategic endeavors that safeguarded vital trade routes and bolstered their economic foundations. Then, the family's trajectory took a decisive turn under Karl I, whose actions alongside his brothers Maximilian and Gundaka laid the foundations for their enduring prominence. Therefore, this period was marked by a series of calculated moves that would firmly entrench the Liechtensteins within the echelons of power. First, Karl's elevation to Grand Count Palatinate by Emperor Rudolf II in 1606 was not merely a title, it was a recognition of his loyalty and service to the Habsburg monarchy. Indeed, this promotion allowed Karl to exert significant influence, as it granted him the authority to bestow knighthoods and other honors, enhancing his stature within the Holy Roman Empire. And the subsequent elevation of Karl to hereditary prince further solidified this ascent. Certainly, this pivotal moment was not just an increase in rank, it was an acknowledgement of the Liechtenstein family's indispensable role within the empire's aristocracy. Being named hereditary prince marked the family's transition into the highest ranks of European nobility, a leap that was both rare and highly significant. Furthermore, the conversion of the Liechtenstein brothers to Catholicism in 1599 was a strategic alignment with the Habsburgs, the reigning dynasty of the Holy Roman Empire known for its staunch Catholicism. And this religious shift was a calculated move to secure the favor of the Habsburgs and to position the Liechtensteins as loyal allies within the empire's dominant religious and political faction. This alignment was crucial as it opened doors to greater influence and opportunities within the Catholic-controlled regions of Europe. And the Bohemian Revolt, a significant uprising against Habsburg authority further tested the Liechtenstein's loyalty. Their unwavering support during this tumultuous period, especially Maximilian's military leadership at the Battle of White Mountain in 1620, was instrumental in the Habsburg's victory. Specifically, this battle was a decisive clash in the Thirty Years' War, a conflict that would shape the political and religious landscape of Europe for decades. And Maximilian's valor and tactical genius not only quashed the rebellion, but also secured the Liechtenstein as a place of honor within the Catholic hierarchy of the empire. In essence, these strategic decisions and alliances were not mere opportunism. They were astute maneuvers that capitalized on the shifting tides of European power dynamics. The Liechtenstein's rise was a blend of military prowess, religious allegiance, 
and political sagacity, culminating in a legacy that would extend far beyond their time, cementing their status as a dynastic power within the Holy Roman Empire. Consequently, their political and military victories paved the way for an ambitious expansion of their holdings. And Karl's governorship of Bohemia and his induction into the Order of the Golden Fleece were but steps towards an ultimate goal, imperial immediacy. By Karl's death in 1627, the Liechtensteins controlled a vast swathe of Central Europe, a clear sign of their ascendance in the feudal hierarchy. But their crowning achievement came in 1719 when Emperor Charles VI recognized the House of Liechtenstein's princely status, unifying their territories under the Principality of Liechtenstein and catapulting them into the higher echelons of political and social circles within the Holy Roman Empire. You see, previously, despite their considerable wealth and influence at the Habsburg court, the Liechtensteins were missing a crucial piece of the aristocratic puzzle, sovereign territory under direct imperial control, a key to unlocking a seat in the imperial diet. The strategic acquisition and subsequent unification of Vaduz and Schellenberg into the Principality of Liechtenstein not only filled this gap, but also bestowed upon the family unprecedented prestige and autonomy. And this transformation occurred against the backdrop of a Europe entangled in political scheming, with the Habsburg monarchy under Charles VI striving to solidify its dominion. Therefore, the creation of the Principality was intertwined with Charles VI's ambitions, notably the pragmatic sanction aimed at ensuring his dynasty's continuity. And for the Liechtensteins, this move was the zenith of centuries of careful marriage strategies, acquisitions and unwavering loyalty to the Habsburgs, emblematic of the nuanced interplay between nobility and imperial authority. Thus began Liechtenstein's journey as an independent entity, skillfully navigating the complex landscape of European politics and maintaining its sovereignty through upheavals and transitions. This newfound status laid the groundwork for the Liechtenstein dynasty's enduring prosperity, underpinned by astute investments and a forward-thinking approach to business, ensuring their legacy well into the modern era as they became a so-called tax haven, which is what we'll discuss in the next chapter. With the dissolution of the Holy Roman Empire, Liechtenstein emerged as a sovereign entity in 1806, a status further solidified with its departure from the German Confederation in 1866, stepping firmly onto the world stage as an independent nation. Thus began the principal economic framework that Liechtenstein is known for today. You see, initially hamstrung by an agrarian economy and scant natural resources, the Principality faced a daunting road to prosperity. The turn of the 20th century, however, marked a dramatic pivot. Severing economic dependencies with Austria post-World War I, Liechtenstein forged a groundbreaking customs and monetary alliance with Switzerland in 1924. And this union was not merely a lifeline. It was a launch pad that propelled Liechtenstein into economic vitality, culminating in a diversified, industrialized economy and a cornerstone of global financial services. Yet, despite their close ties, including Switzerland's representation of Liechtenstein's diplomatic interests, the Principality has unwaveringly maintained its sovereignty, and this independence was eventually internationally recognized. Furthermore, in the early 20th century, Liechtenstein embarked on an economic voyage that would irrevocably steer it towards becoming a beacon for global capital in search of tax optimization. This journey was kick-started with a pivotal decision in 1924 to adopt the Swiss franc, following the aforementioned customs and monetary union with Switzerland. This move not only ensured economic stability, but also seamlessly integrated Liechtenstein into a broader financial ecosystem. The turning point, however, came in 1928, when Liechtenstein enacted legislation that paved the way for the establishment of holding companies, offering them enticing tax exemptions. This legislative masterstroke positioned the Principality as an attractive destination for international capital, setting the stage for its evolution into a renowned tax haven. As years rolled into decades, Liechtenstein meticulously honed its legal framework, significantly boosting its allure as a financial sanctuary. 
Indeed, the principality became synonymous with a high level of confidentiality and privacy, thanks, in part, to its stringent banking secrecy laws. This veil of secrecy proved to be a magnet for wealth from across the globe, drawing in funds keen to sidestep taxation or evade scrutiny in their countries of origin. And Liechtenstein's tax regime is distinguished by a plethora of incentives and exemptions, all meticulously crafted to lure foreign investment and holding companies. Notably, the Principality extends profit tax exemptions to corporations pursuing charitable, cultural or idealistic endeavours without engaging in commercial activities. Moreover, holding companies that derive their income from dividends and capital gains on shares enjoy lucrative tax breaks. However, the Principality's status as a tax haven has been a double-edged sword, attracting not just investment, but also controversy. The 2008 tax affair shone a spotlight on Liechtenstein's involvement in global tax evasion schemes, eliciting calls for enhanced transparency and international cooperation in tax matters. In an effort to shed its image as a facilitator of tax evasion, Liechtenstein made a significant policy shift in 2013, ceasing its support for foreigners seeking to conceal money from their tax authorities, and this move was indicative of the Principality's commitment to aligning itself with global tax standards. Yet, despite strides towards transparency, Liechtenstein's legacy as a tax haven continues to be a focal point of scrutiny. Thus, the Principality finds itself at a crossroads, striving to balance its economic aspirations with the global demand for financial integrity and cooperation. As it forges ahead, Liechtenstein remains a pivotal figure in the domain of international finance and tax planning, a role that is as complex as it is critical in the ever-evolving global financial landscape. However, just like we started this video, the actual royal family of Liechtenstein itself has an equally harrowing future to navigate, with Gen Z members popping out left and right and a succession plan needing to be solidified. In Liechtenstein, hereditary Prince Alois stands as a beacon of continuity and vision for this Alpine Principality. Born as the heir apparent on the 11th of June 1968, Alois was groomed from an early age for the mantle of leadership, a journey that took him from the esteemed halls of the Liechtenstein Gymnasium to the disciplined ranks of the Coldstream Guards, courtesy of his education at the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. Assuming the regency in August 2004, as mentioned earlier, Alois has since been the linchpin of Liechtenstein's governance, acting on behalf of Prince Hans Adam II. This role has allowed him to hone his skills in statecraft and diplomacy, with his duties spanning the local and the global stage, from spearheading Liechtenstein's presence at United Nations meetings to ceremoniously opening the National Parliament. And Alois's tenure is characterized by a delicate balancing act, honoring the Principality's storied heritage while steering it towards a future that is both sustainable and globally minded. His acumen extends into the economic realm as well, where he oversees the Prince of Liechtenstein Foundation, safeguarding the princely family's substantial financial and cultural heritage. This role underscores Alois's adeptness in ensuring the Principality's prosperity, leveraging its economic strengths with strategic insight. The political landscape of Liechtenstein, too, has felt Alois's influence, with his regency marked by constitutional reforms and open dialogues on pivotal national issues. Furthermore, Alois's personal life is intertwined with his royal duties. Married to Duchess Sophie in Bavaria, the couple forms a partnership that bridges Liechtenstein with broader European aristocracy. Their four children, Prince Joseph Wenzel, Princess Marie Caroline, Prince Georg and Prince Nicholas carry forward the lineage, each bearing the Count or Countess of Rietberg title, a nod to their heritage and responsibilities. And the succession line, rooted in the principle of agnatic primogeniture, underscores the continuity of the princely family's legacy. Alois leads this lineage, followed by his children and siblings, ensuring the throne's future. But this system, although it's steeped in tradition, allows for adaptation, including provisions for renunciation and the adoption of an heir presumptive, albeit within the constraints of male patrilineal descent. 
As Liechtenstein navigates the 21st century, therefore, hereditary Prince Alois embodies the fusion of legacy and innovation, a steward of both his family's history and the Principality's future. Therefore, as the Principality of Liechtenstein looks to the future, the fusion of maintaining its cultural treasures with the exigencies of modern governance and global participation reflects a delicate balance between honoring tradition and adapting to an ever-changing world. And now we'd like to see you in the comments. Which European royal family would you like us to feature next on this channel? Let us know below, and if you see a family mention that you're already interested in, be sure to give a like to the person who commented on it so that we're sure to see the top-rated ones. With that said, thanks again for your time and viewership, and cheers, until we see you on the next one.